this week on The Startup Life. And so the principle is those companies that encourage and allow people to return have a strategic advantage over those who don't. Because the things that you do to create a company that people return to are the things that create a sustainable business. All right, Startup Nation, so let's take flight with Lee Carraher, founder and CEO of Double Forte. The Startup Life begins now. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. You'll never have the sacred stone. <laughs> Hey, Startup Nation. Do you enjoy the startup life? Now you can let the world know with gear from the show. Choose from the label yourself, make your own look, and making money t-shirts to tell your story of your path of entrepreneurship. Click the link in the show notes to purchase. All right, Startup Nation. So I hope you're ready to receive some value today. We have a special guest in the building today. We have Lee Carraher from Double Forte. How's it going, Lee? Dominic, it's awesome. I'm so happy to be with you today. Awesome. Are you ready to pour some knowledge into Startup Nation today? I'm going to do my best. Awesome. As always, Startup Nation, the Startup Life is brought to you by the Binge Podcast Network. So, Lee, if you would, please, ma'am, tell us about your story or your path to entrepreneurship and tell us a little bit about Double Forte. Sure. So, Double Forte, which is a public relations and social media firm, I founded this company 16 years ago. Um, and I'm not sure I ever thought it would make it 16 years, but here we are. <laughs> Awesome. And actually, I created the company out of a need. I didn't think I was going to start my own firm. Um, this was in 2002. I had quit my job at my last company. It was a big PR firm after 9-11 because 9-11 was sort of that, for me, that moment was like, I don't like what I'm doing. I am. Uh, why am I doing this? Because I'd actually been on the same flight from New York to San Francisco one week earlier than 9-11. And um, oh, wow. I, yeah, so I exercised my contract, I made it graceful, well, as graceful as I could, exit, and I thought I was going to stay out of, you know, just take a year off. I had two young kids, I've been working well, you know, since grad, waiting for college, and of course the, um, well, I got in my own way on that one because I drove my husband crazy, and he basically said, honey, if we don't go back to work, man, it is not going to work for us. <laughs> got you. <laughs> I had a lot of glue guns. I had things going on. I, had, I was basically the tyrant of the laundry. It was not good. So I thought I was going to take another job. I was way down the line on two offers when, after about four months, so into 2002, when um, my mom got sick and my mom lived in oh, no. Wisconsin. I live in California. Right. She was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer and given four months to live. Oh my goodness. Um, and I knew I couldn't take a job in California because I was going to be with my mom and there was no way I was either going to get fired or have to quit from a job. Right. For sure. So you don't get that time back, right? So the beautiful Absolutely. thing That's was right. that my mom actually lived almost four years, which is a huge gift. Um, but it was very clear at that moment. I was like, oh my gosh, here I am. This is the, here is a crossroads in my life. I'm the breadwinner in our house. My husband's the chief home officer i'm the right. chief bacon officer for sure and for sure. i gotta bring it home right baby needs mm -hmm. some shoes and i'm gonna have to start my own company because i need to be where my family needs me to be from this moment forward and i had really i had thought about it as my nuclear family you know as the breadwinner i hadn't thought about it as my extended family for sure so for sure. um Basically, I was like, okay, well, I better start my own company that I can control where I am because I need to be where I need to be and have and don't have to apologize for it. And I had started a company for uh, my la the inner public, which is where I was before Double Forte. I had started two practices for them and a company for them. So I, I knew the steps to take, but it, this was my own money, right? It was like, ah! Absolutely right. So, <laughs> but it was just very clear. Here was the moment in time. I'm going to have to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this because this is the right thing for my family. And that's really what led me to starting my own company uh, with my own resources, uh, which was basically a quarter and two dimes. 
but um, <laughs> yeah, maybe you can relate. So for sure, um, for sure. And then from there, uh, you know, my mom lived for four years, and so I spent half. I had a co-founder who mm -hmm. I'd worked with before. Um, we had worked many years uh, in previous two jobs for both of us uh, before, and I spent half the year in Wisconsin and half the year in San Francisco for the first four years of this company. Then actually my co-founder after, you know, it was very clear my mom was, you know, going to, you know, she wasn't going to last another deathbed situation. Mm -hmm. My co-founder, you know, had his own path and he decided he wanted to do something very different. So I bought him out um, actually a month before my mom died. Mm. And my mom, um, and then I was the sole owner. I've been the sole owner ever since. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing that. I'm sorry no. to hear about your mom. No. Well, you yeah. know, I think a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, I think some of us do it because I always wanted to be my own boss. For sure. And some of us do it because I, I know I can make my own opportunity. And mm -hmm. some of us do it because this is the best option for us as people. Right. Know? Right. And, um, now I don't know if I could, I'm probably unemployable because I've been my own boss for 16 years. Oh, so who knows? <laughs> I know that feeling. I know that feeling all too well. I know exactly what you mean. Oh Leave a good follow-up question because you talked sure. about, you know, uh, your, your husband and your two kids. Yeah. And, and, you know, what's that dynamic like? Because we have a lot of uh, women uh, entrepreneurs in Startup Nation to where that dynamic is the same to where they're the breadwinner, mm -hmm. they're the, the entrepreneur and, the, you know, and the... Uh, husband stays home and they have two kids. Tell us about that dynamic of being sure. an entrepreneur, mom, husband, stuff like that. Yeah. So my husband um, actually worked half time until just the last year and a half. Okay. Um, when my first son was born, we thought he would go back to work. You know, we had this conversation when I was pregnant. You know, we want to be involved. I made more money than he was a chef at the time. Okay. Um, and when and I was like, well, one of us has to change our schedules because we're not seeing each other because a chef sort of works from 2 p.m. to 2 a.m. and I was working sure. 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. So he actually went in uh, before um, I gave birth to my first child, he changed his job and he went into produce sales for inside sales for chefs. Okay. And then um, we had our first child, and he was like, "You know what? One of I I need to be more involved. Uh, one of us needs to be more involved with our kid. Uh, it better be me, Lee, because you make more money than I do." And <laughs> gotcha. I was like, "Okay." Um, and he worked half time, and then we had a second child who ended up actually. My second child actually has special needs. Okay. Um, and we'll, he's now 18, but he'll never be independent. And so I was very fortunate. I was so fortunate that I had a husband who wanted to stay home. Right. who wanted to be the chief home officer, who would take responsibility for all the things that, uh, you know, the ch the primary child, you know, get kids here, get kids there kind for of sure. thing. For sure, for sure. I was so fortunate for that. And so that's what basically we divided and conquered that way. It has not always been simple because I have a definite point of view about how things should be done in my own house. Absolutely. And I have to give that up. I have to give a lot of it up. Um, I don't give up the laundry because I really care about how things are folded. But I gave up everything else. Got gotcha. you. <laughs> but I'm so fortunate. My husband makes dinner. He does all the dr shopping. He makes. He handles all the house I mean, He does everything in the house. And for sure. basically, for me, how I what I had to do to decide what did I care about? What did I care about most? Mm. And I really cared about being involved in in a way that made sense. And the, so did we both have to go to doctor's appointments only when they were critical. And so gotcha. for my younger son, we had several critical doctor's appointments because he, again, he has special needs. And when my young, my older son, he had some critical situations that I was responsible for, you know, because the mom was going to go to the hospital. That was the deal. Gotcha. So I, we were basically able to, we made very clear roles um, and, so, and, and early on, I st we both stepped over each other's toes a bit, and then we just figured it out. So how we do it, I'll just tell you, we have a meeting every Sunday, and we have for the last uh, 20 years. Okay. We have a meeting every Sunday where we bring out the calendars, and we go through what's going on uh, and for the next two weeks, because everything changes, you know. Gotcha, so for sure. And um, if something's going on with the kids, I like for doctor's appointments that I, I learned that I, what I needed to do was give him a list of questions because he would go to the doctor's appointment and I know all the ladies in the house are going to be shaking, you know, nodding their heads at this. Okay. And uh, they'd be like, I'd go, how? Oh, hey, how was the doctor? It was good. Uh -oh. That is not enough information <laughs> for mom. Gotcha. Like, so what happened? Well, you know, he we went in and she said he was fine. I'm like, oh my God. 
So what I learned was I had to give a set of very clear questions. So I gave a set of questions and then I also gave a set of um, treed answers. If this, then that, if this and that. And that was a way that my husband could be empowered to be in charge, but also uh, make sure that my curiosity was uh, satisfied and that I wasn't sure. judgmental on him. So I'll give you a good example. So my older son is very tall. He is uh, six six. Oh wow! And he's always been tall. So when he was five, he had his you know five is a big checkup. He mm -hmm. goes to his five year checkup and I, he goes. I come back. Um, he comes back and at night I go. Oh, how was it? Well, he's off the charts. I'm like, well, what does that mean off the charts? <laughs> is that good? Is that bad? Is he too heavy? Is he too tall? I mean, are they worried about him being a giant? I mean, what? You know, he's just <laughs> off the charts. Like, that is not an information for me. And he says, I said, so what does off the chart mean, honey? He goes, well, they had to get graph paper and attach it to his chart because he's too tall for the chart. I'm like, okay, oh. now I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I need that detail, right? And so women need a lot more detail in general than men. Um, I found that true everywhere I go. For sure. Um, so we just figure it out. It's not always easy, um, but the thing for us is having that meeting on Sunday, looking at the calendars, looking at what's scheduled, saying, oh, you know what? I want to participate that. How can I participate in that? I'm going to move some meetings around, or I don't need to participate in that. And I talk to my kids, I'm like, I can go to three things this month. What three things are most important to you? Um, and they would tell me what was most important to them. And then I would rearrange if I could. So yeah. it was a lot of, it's a just, it's a lot of communication. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing that. And as yeah. a husband myself, I, I, I do the exact same thing. I'm working <laughs> on it, I swear. I, I'm working on it for sure. I mean, it's hard. It's it is. hard. It is. It is for sure. Lee, let me ask you this. Uh, you know, who or what inspires you as an entrepreneur and why? You know, as a business model, who inspires me? Okay. Um, is that what you mean? I, I just mean like, you know, just like a person who builds something from nothing and stuff like that. Oh, you know? yeah. yeah. Well, oh my gosh, there's so many. Um, I am inspired by, well, Michelle Obama. Okay. <laughs> I'm so inspired by Michelle Obama. Awesome. I am inspired by, I'm not very inspired by many of the entrepreneurs in San, San Silicon Valley, frankly. Wow, really? Um, well, you know, they a lot of them, there are some who came from nothing, but not there are not very many who came from nothing. Oh, you know? okay. Um, and they all, you know, really hard to build a business, really hard to build a successful business. Not easy to be Steve Jobs, lose sure. your company, come back, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. But, you know, I am inspired by people who keep it together and are authentic and keep them, keep true to themselves. So I'm probably more inspired by more small companies than I am by large companies. Um, yeah. But I would say some companies that inspire me are Cliff Bar inspires me. We worked sure. with Cliff Bar for about 10 years and Gary and Kit inspire me. I'm inspired by Tarani, the syrup company, because it's a family owned company that could have been bought and sold 19 times and they kept true to their roots. Gotcha. I'm inspired by some people that uh, Navitas, which is a, a organic superfoods company that again has been, you know, 15 years old on the ropes For and sure. always made it through. So I'm inspired by the stories where people um, didn't give up or didn't sell out. <laughs> I hear that. I hear that. I definitely you know. Because I think if you are uh, if you are a successful company um, in any stretch of the imagination, so from small making it 15 years and being small to being large uh, mm -hmm. and being you know, making it. And obviously, you you know, in the last 15 years, if you've made it 15 years, you have reinvented yourself five or six times. For sure. In, in any industry. Um, and there's always going to be one, someone who wants to buy you. And there's always mm -hmm. going to be someone who say, hey, I want a little some of that special sauce. Right. Um, and they want, really, they don't want the business. They want the people. That's how I know we got something going on when people want to buy us. But the, I'm never um, inspired by what the result would be by that. So, <laughs> got you. Well, you know. Look no, for sure. But let me ask you a quick follow up real quick. My mind yeah. is blown about that Silicon Valley thing, because like, you know, for people, you know, I'm here in Memphis, Tennessee. And for those right. of us who don't live in Silicon Valley, that's a very interesting, you know, comment you right. for sure. But thank you for sharing that. But I, I want to ask you just really quickly, like, you know, when you get those offers to buy, you yeah. know, you know, to buy your company, whatever the case may be, where does the resistance come from? You know, like, okay, okay. Yeah. Fair For enough. me, where's well, like, oh, well, that's very nice. Well, what would the price be, right? For sure. And we're, we're a service company, so there's not a bad margin, right? You're not looking right. at 
large multiples uh, in a purchase. You're not looking for, you're not looking at uh, a large margin in our business because it's a time-based business, not mm -hmm. a margin-based business. Right. So really what I'm always interested in is why do you want us? Why would be, because I've had, you know, uh, I've been in this business for a long time. My last company had 650 people. Right. And my company before that had over 700 people. You know, so I've managed much larger organizations than the one I currently own. Right. Um, but like, why are you interested in us? Well, I want you, Lee, to do this job. Mm. They're not really interested in me growing my business. They're interested in taking our people and deploying them against their entity, which makes a lot of sense. And I'm never really interested in the job they want me to do. That's funny. So, um, you know, I don't only really, when I fly around the country and not be able to do the things I like to do. I'm not really interested in not being involved in the actual business. Uh, I'm not really interested in not being able to say, yeah, I'm going to be at that basketball game. Right. I had that job. I mean, that's the job I left. Um, sure. I made so much more money when I was at that company. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> but when 9-11 happened, I realized I was working for some a company that, I mean, they were so generous to me. This company was so generous to me, but I was doing things I didn't want to do. I was never home. I was mm. flying around the world. I had a huge intergalactic job, a lot of money, <laughs> but I was really unhappy. And for me, it's like, for me deciding to be an entrepreneur, to own my own company, it's like, I have to decide what is success for Lee? Because yeah. what success for Lee is, is going to drive our success. Uh, if it's not success for Lee, then the business will not thrive because I will not be interested. And um, there hasn't been an offer on the business that was, you know, we all have a number, a candy right. pot, truly, right. but right. The, number, the number was never big enough to trade off on the role people wanted me to play, which was always a big role. I mean, it was mm -hmm. very, I mean, I'm honored to have those kind of discussions, right? Right. Because the resulting lifestyle would be one I would not be happy with. Gotcha. So, I mean, I can be bought, but the number's never been high enough. So I just want to be clear about that. You know, Understood. It Understood. sounds very altruistic. Oh, it's never good enough. Oh, no, I'm sure there's a number. Gotcha. It has, it has not have, showed up yet. <laughs> it has not showed up yet. Fair enough. Fair enough. Thought up Nation, I want to chime in really quickly because Lee brings up an interesting point when she talks about the potential sale of her company. Now, when you start your company, you're going to fall in probably one or two lanes, right? You're either the stayer or the exeter. Let me explain what that means. If you're a stayer in the company, that means that you just want to be in that company for as long as it takes, right? You just want to stay and scale that company, grow that company through acquisitions and mergers and strategic investments or whatever the case may be. If you're the exeter, you'll do some of those things, but your ultimate goal is to try to exit the company. Now, I bring this up because you're going to make certain decisions based on one of those two lanes, right? If you're the stayer, you're, look, you're always scouting what's the next investment what's the next merger or acquisition or wherever the case may be if you're the exeter you're thinking about what's the act what's the number what's the valuation that you need to get at what's the the place you want the company to be there to be the most attractive to investors to kind of buy you out if you will now that is not to say that if you plan on in the beginning to be a stayer then all of a sudden you become an exeter because that happens too but i wanted to bring that up to you startup nation to think about that on your path to entrepreneurship because it will really frame the type of decision making that you make in your company let's get back to lee so, Lee, I want to ask you about, you know, your, the book you wrote a few years ago, right? Millennials and Management, right? You yes. Know, and in that book, you talk about, you know, uh, September 15th, 2008, which uh, seems yes. somewhat like of a turning point for you in the business. Can you share that with us and what happened? Sure. So when I started the company in 2002, we decided mm -hmm. nobody under 10 years of experience we were going to work with because we were tired of complaining about Gen Xers, frankly. Right. Uh, and in San Francisco, 2002, you couldn't swing a dead cat without hitting 20 people with 10 years of experience who didn't have a job. Fair enough. So it was not hard, right? Mm -hmm. And um, by 2008, the business had grown to probably 18 people and grew from zero, maybe like a two, $2.5 million. And I was literally at my son's riding lesson on September 13th, which was the Saturday. Um, his godfather gave him riding lessons. I was like, you're in this for your rest of your life. Gotcha. And um, <laughs> I'm like, you know what? <laughs> I would like to ride. I've been working my butt off. My mom is gone. I've done my thing. Gotcha. I think I'm going to work four days a week. I think I can do that. And I got this great team. 
Then on the 14th, I figured out how to do that. I'm like, I'm going to, I mean, I was going to work 40 hours, but, or 50, 60 hours as we mm -hmm. all do, but I just was going to make sure Wednesdays, I was going to take off and go take riding lessons so I could ride with my kid. Right. And I figured out how I was going to do that. And I show up September 15th, Monday, Monday morning, which was when the economy, you know, almost collapsed. In the right. Morning, right. For sure. And I realized by 10 o'clock, I was like, I'll be lucky at five days a week at 10 30, six days a week at mm -hmm. 11, eight days a week. Right. Right. And it, I mean, that dream went out the window and my CFO at the time was part time and he was down in San Jose. I'm like, I, Oscar, get your butt up here. We're going to figure this out because I'd been through This was the third, fourth downturn I'd been through as a business person. Gotcha. Um, so by the end of the day, when, you know, basically we were pulled back from the jaws of death by an inch. Absolutely. A, by a country, right? Absolutely. Um, I was like, okay, let's look at the situation. The situation is we have four of our startups in New York right now looking for money they are not going to get. Mm. We have clients who are, their business was already getting soft in retail and they're going to, you know, contract. We are, you know, we have clients who are a little behind on their payments. We may not get those. We're going to have some clients who couldn't go out of business. Uh, they're not going to be able to pay us. So what's going to happen? So basically uh, we stripped out every single expense we could find in our budget. Mm. And so that was lunch, that was parking, that was, you know, extra right. music all this stuff. And, um, basically it was, we're going to provide water. That's what we're going to provide. <laughs> and, um, I froze all salaries and I said, okay, guys, here's the deal. We don't know. We what we know is we're probably going to lose these four clients. And we think these three clients are going to retract. And our goal is to keep the three clients that are going to retract. That's our goal. The four yeah. clients we're going to leave. Don't spend any time. Cause they don't have any money. So don't spend, they're not going to get any money. They don't have any money. Don't worry about them. I mean, right. be, nice, be cordial, be professional, but there's no reason to invest in these guys because they're not going to make it. We need to make it so that they, you know, we treat them with professionalism and do our service to them and then wrap them up in a bow because they aren't going to be with us for another 60 days. Gotcha. And, you, we need to be the easiest agency to work with. We have to be the easiest people, easiest company to work with so that we do great results, but we have to be easy to work with. So stop, we need to stop saying no. Gotcha. Because not that no is not the right answer most of the time. Right. But, but the, if a client calls you and your first answer is, that's not a good idea or no, or no, I don't want to do that. Then uh, all they're hearing is resistance. And now it has now become a buyer's market. And, um, we have to say, we have to get to know through yes. And what that means is tell me more. What are you trying to accomplish? Um, oh, well, how about this idea instead, right? Um, and so that was the first piece. Then, and then that was September 17th. We made that decision, right? Gotcha. Pro salaries, da, 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 da. So then um, actually we ended up winning some clients, losing the four that we thought we were going to lose, all this kind of stuff. And in, in January of 2008, mm -hmm. we did have a small layoff of three people. And then, um, but everything was so solid with down to 15 people, which was, we were, I thought we were very lucky to get to just have to uh, get rid of, we really had to lay off one and a half. And I think you should always double what you have to do. Um, sure. Then I looked at the business model and I realized that our business model was just predicated on hiring people with 10 years of experience was going to be irrelevant very shortly. Right. So 2000 to 2004, almost no one got hired in PR business in San Francisco in the, in the NASDAQ collapse. And so in San Francisco in particular got really killed by the NASDAQ, you know, the we call Absolutely. It, um, collapse. And right. almost no one got hired between 2000 and 2004 in our industry. So there was a big donut hole where we we're not going to have anybody for about five years who had 10 years of experience. We we're going to have people who had five years experience, people had 20 years of experience, but really very few with 10. So I said, oh gosh. And people with 10 years experience cost more than people with one year experience too, right? Mm -hmm. So I was like, wow, we're going to run out of the bottom of our eligibility. And, you, and my other belief is you should always be bringing people at the bottom of your eligibility for new blood, but we're going to have no new blood. Right. And no one was going to move to San Francisco in 2009. And no one moved to San Francisco in 2009. Right. So that's, I decided that we should, okay, we're going to change our model and we're going to have to grow our own 
uh, people and we're going to hire uh, recent graduates and change the model, did all the things, blah, blah, blah. And it took us a while because I, what I should, what I could have done is fire half the people and hire all, you know, 22 year olds. Right. But that's not the way I operate. Um, it would have been much more efficient, um, but that seemed cruel and that's not really how I operate. So it just took sure. us a while. I didn't really think anything of it. I, like I said, I'd had so many hundreds of people in the last two jobs. Most of them, like the vast majority of them, 80%, 75% of them were under 30. I was known for being able to you know, keep young people excited. And I hired my first, what I came to found out was a millennial. And that first day, mm -hmm. I walk in about 10 o'clock. That's a very long answer, Dominic. Sorry. But I no, walk no in worries, at 10 no and there's a dog in my office. Okay. Like, What's this dog doing here? <laughs> and it's not just a dog. It's a dog. And the dog has a big bed and a water filtration system and a oh, kibble nice. dispenser. I dog mean, looks better dog. than me. Uh, hello. <laughs> so I look around. I'm like, who's the dog? And, oh, that's Stephanie's dog. You mean the new girl who started today? Yes. And I probably should have said girl, but you know, that's right. what I said. Right. I said, really? Well, did we know she was bringing the dog? No. Did she ask if she could bring the dog? No. Is anybody allergic to dogs? I don't know. Well, let's find that out first, you know? Right. And uh, I go to my office. I'm sort of perplexed. And then a uh, person, you know, my person comes in and goes, uh, Lee, the dog, it's a service dog. We can actually can't, we're not allowed to ask the dog. Right. I'm like, it's a chihuahua. What do you mean <laughs> it's a service dog? <laughs> and I had not seen a chihuahua service dog. It's actually a mental health dog, and it was legit, as legit right. as maybe that could be. Right. And uh, I was like, okay. And I was just sort of flabbergasted that she didn't even ask or tell us, right? Gotcha. She shows up at 9 o'clock, first day on the job with her dog bed. Um, and then I come out of my office around 3.30. I'm like, oh, where's Stephanie and the dog? Uh, she's gone. What? Yeah, well, <laughs> she left around 3. I'm like, what? <laughs> what? You know, wow. she had to go to San Diego. I'm like, What? Right. And she won't be here tomorrow either. And I'm just like, what is, what am I being, you know, videoed? Is this a <laughs> show? I bet that what? was different for sure. Right. And I'm like, did she tell us she had to leave at three o'clock? Did she ask if she could not be here her second day? No, no, no. Okay. All right. So I'm flabbergasted. I'm like, what just happened? So I call some friends who are also in the business I'm in, I said, okay, so this just happened. And this is what I got. Oh my God, Lee, they're millennials. They're terrible. <laughs> Fire her right away. <laughs> they're terrible. Millennials, they're the worst scourge on the planet. You know, some, all this crap. And I'm like, right. okay, what's a millennial? <laughs> right? <laughs> so, uh, and I sort of dismissed that. So, you know, Stephanie gotcha. came back to work on Wednesday. We figured Stephanie out. We're like, okay, Stephanie, you can't just like do stuff. You got to like ask for permission and get approval and, We'll work it out. She's fantastic. I mean, this woman is a rock star. Right. Uh, you know, unbelievable. Uh, she was with us for four years. She's had mm -hmm. a fantastic, we're still great friends and great in touch. We, so we uh, give business to each other all the time. Gotcha. Um, however, it was sort of an eye-opening experience, but it took us, a, then we had, we got that sorted. Within two months, Dominic, I had six or seven other dogs in the office with little red vests. <laughs> the floodgates open, huh? Because she ran a little business on the side getting, you know, how do you get your dog to be a service dog? Um, oh. I'm like, okay, well, all right. Can't that genius. I guess we need a policy. All right, right then. <laughs> right. And then about uh, eight months and nine months later, we hired six millennials within, you know, six or seven weeks of each other. And mm -hmm. with three months they were all gone oh, wow. and a hundred percent failure uh in hiring i'd never had a hundred percent failure in hiring i can you know uh, six people at a time think of it as a class right and I'm right like, wow one of them could be a bad hire but i don't you don't hire 600 people and have them be bad hires you know that's true so I was like i'm good hirer we have good practice we couldn't retain and one of the people i walked not me, but someone else walked and the other five quit within three months. I'm like, holy crap. Wow. And um, I just, I, you know, actually figured this was a moment of clarity where the sun shined through and someone spoke to me and said, it's not them, it's you, Lee. And mm. I was like, it can't be, it can't be them. I don't, I don't hire bad, you know, I right. hire once in a while, but not six at a time. Right. And it's got to be what we're doing. It's got to be us. It can't be them. So um, that's when I really started researching 
And everything I found, this is now 2011-ish, I guess, mm -hmm. yeah, 2011, um, it's negative. So negative. Millennials are terrible. Millennials are lazy. Millennials are entitled. Millennials are this. Millennials are that. Blah, 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 blah. Nothing was good. Millennials hated millennials. So uh, there, there, there's some truth to that. I, because I, I'm a, to that. right. Because I'm an older millennial, like 82. Yeah. And even I'm yeah. like, come on, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, there's now there's three sets of millennials. You right. Know, there's a lot of we can talk about that for days. But mm -hmm. anyway, so everything I read was negative. And I hear I had just decided that my business was predicated on hiring young people. And some people were like, I'm not hiring any more millennials ever. I'm like, so then basically you're giving up on your business. Basically, right. Don't you have a millennial in your business? You don't have a future in your business. Close now. Mm. Um, and I decided that, okay, I can't be, I, you know, I could just sell out and go work for somebody else and be miserable right. or I can figure this out. <laughs> and I was like, okay, yeah. I'm not hireable. I should figure this out. So I went to figure it out myself, did a lot of research, talked to hundreds of people just to figure it out for our company, my little baby company. Um, and, and so that was 2011, 2012. The average tenure for a millennial in San Francisco was about 13 months. Okay. And I said, okay, if we can double it, if we could, our average can be 26 months, we win. Because every time you lose somebody, you know, you're walking, you're watching $100,000 walk out the door. So 20, let's just shoot for double. Cause I'm a, I like to achieve high. We're going to go for 200%. <laughs> so, <All right. laughs> um, that was our goal. In the end, now we are, you know, uh, for people under 30, our average tenure is four and a half years. And uh, I'm really proud of that. I hate when people leave, but I'm really proud that they stay for four and a half, five, six years. And I learned a lot of stuff along the way, right? Things that we were doing, we were just doing ways that boomers and Xers understood, but that this generation did not and were not inspired by. And uh, what I found was when you do things that inspires and helps the younger colleague uh, thrive, your older colleagues thrive too. So sure. I didn't have a thought of writing a book. And I was mm -hmm. in a meeting with a publisher about something totally different, actually. Right. Um, and we were interrupt i had hired someone who was about to publish a book and the publisher wanted to make sure that this woman's um new company was going to you know support the book so right. I was, we got interrupted by somebody a young person who was incredibly rude and um when she left the office this woman the woman i was talking to sort of rolled her eyes and said oh my god these millennials are so terrible <laughs> and here i had just done all this research and figured stuff out and you know increased our our retention rate and all that kind of stuff and i just said hey well, well what, what's the problem uh you know well and just she walked through all the stuff and i gave her suggestions i'm like oh have you tried this am i experienced that maybe you should try this this is what happened to us this is what we did blah 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 right. and she said i will publish that book and i said what book are you talking about and she said that book about millennials you just said about i'm like i don't have a book about millennials she goes yes you do and can you get it done in four months so that is how hmm. i got my first publishing deal okay because I uh, had gone through the pain of 100% failure and uh, done the work to figure it out. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing that. All right, Startup Nation, I hope you're getting great value from Lee's content, but we got to pay a few bills. Once again, my name is Dominic Lawson, and you're listening to The Startup Life.
Hey business owner, the Startup Life reach is growing. Wouldn't you like your business to grow with it? Reach out to us to advertise on the Startup Life. You can reach us at 901-857-4818 or you can email me at dominic at askalsolutions.com. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, this is a great music to have break on, but wouldn't this break sound a lot better with the same music but your business being advertised on it? Need more content from The Startup Life, you say? You can now sign up for The Startup Life All Access Pass on the Binge Podcast Network's Patreon page. There is exclusive content written by yours truly, video content where I share even more of my business philosophies and whatever crazy content I can think of out of that crazy head of mine. And at only $5 a month, yeah, $5 a month, this is more content for you, Startup Nation, to really get ahead of your competition. So instead of upsizing that meal at your favorite fast food joint, you can now invest in yourself on your path to entrepreneurship. Click the link in the show notes to sign up. Uh, Really quickly, you know, this is, you know, and you mentioned this a lot of time in your talks or whatever. This is the first time in American history where we have four mm-hmm. different generations in a work. And now five. Actually, okay, now five. five. With Gen five. Z, yeah. Uh, exactly, mm-hmm. right? So, mm-hmm. you know, what does a small business owner need to understand about this unprecedented dynamic in our American world? Yeah, it is. An, uh, it's never happened before. Right. Um, and it will continue. It's not going to undo itself, right? Sure. Right. So, um, you know, we've just, we've come through the, you know, boomers uh, are Carl boomers, not only because there were so many of us, I'm mm-hmm. the last year of boomer, but also because the economy was just doubling and tripling and quadrupling, just growing the whole time that boomers were coming and growing in the workforce. Right. So there was always opportunity for us, even in downturns, we didn't have to wait very long for our opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing, uh, and so people are working longer because one, they're living longer, but and two, they don't have a lot of money. People are not, people are not prepared to retire. Right. And there's a lot of reasons for that. We could talk all day about that, but that's the bottom line. Most people don't have a thousand dollars for an emergency, right? right? Mm -hmm. That's just the way people are working into their nineties at McDonald's and stuff. I mean, that's just happening. Right. So, um, and then Gen Z is 20 this year. The oldest Gen Z is 23. So that's five generations, Gen Z, millennials, Gen X, boomers, and silence all at the same time. And the Mm -hmm. thing is that in a small business, you probably will need all of those. And you'll probably have all of those people apply for jobs. Um, and there's a couple of things on that. One, ageism is alive and well. And it is. anything you can do to get that bias out of your head, you should do. Because gotcha. it will inhibit you hiring the best people. Um, so that's the first thing, right? Mm-hmm. So that you might be inhibit. You know, I say, you know what? She's 60. She's, she's old. She's overqualified. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't hire that person. Uh, because... You know, a 60 year old woman who may have a lot of energy, lots of energy, learned all new things and be, you know, provide some backbone and some experience and some calmness to um, a younger staff who doesn't know what's going on. Right. 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 <laughs> so I think the workforce is going to look a lot different. So one, if you can get, you know, just strip away the idea of the ageism, uh, which is in all of us, uh, I would encourage you to do that. Two is that, um, you know, there definitely are some similarity, you know, gen, you know, isms are terrible, but they're they also, are. but they're also rooted, rooted in some truth. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, so for instance, uh, millennial, the younger, so you're an old, you're in the oldest set of millennials and yes. then the youngest set of millennials actually learned very differently than you did. Right. So you did probably did not have iPads in your classroom. And no. You didn't use video. No, no. But your younger millennial, the youngest set of millennials use iPads in the classroom, used video at home and did a homework in the classroom. Right. Totally upside down learning, right? Right. Um, And they were doing things, everything was online. Like you have to submit your homework online as an eighth grader. Like what? Right. (laughs) And maybe uh, they've never used, um, they've maybe, maybe I've had hired uh, millennials who never printed out a piece of paper. Mm, Everything was online. Right. Right. And I'm like, where's the piece of paper I need? Right. Right. <laughs> like, here's the link, because that's how they learned. So, right. uh, and they've had more power in their hands since they were five or six, and now True. Gen Z since they were two or three, then went to the moon, and we got the, we got that power at the same time as our our colleagues who are 20 years younger than us did. Right. 
right? So uh, when you grow up with that power in your hand and the impression of access to anybody and any piece of information versus when you are old, uh, you're the older millennial, the Gen X or boomer, where you were given access when you earned it. Right. There is a different impression of what you, uh, what is normal. For so, sure. So one is like what the most important thing for any business owner is to set the values and the behaviors for your entity. Okay. What do you stand for? What are you about? And how do you live those values? So um, does it mean that the youngest person picks up the trash or do we all pick up the trash? Does it mean that, um, you know, what does it mean? So you have to figure out those behaviors. And if you're looking for, you know, I think that uh, Patrick Lencioni's book, The Advantage is probably the best template people can use if you don't, if you're not ready, if you haven't done this work before on figuring out what the values are and what are the behaviors that your entity will have. Because when you have a set set of behaviors, it doesn't matter how old you are. You all agree to the behaviors that you're going to have together. Right. Um, because the, the word should is like the worst thing that has happened, can happen in a group. Well, they should know. They should know when end of business is. Well, right. they've never had end of day. Their end of day is 11 59 because that's when papers were due in college. Right. You know, and they get into the business world and the end of day means something different to you and me. Right, for sure. And, they, and so end of day, I could say, it's end, you know, just give it to me by the end of day. Uh, right. And they give it to me at 11 59 59. <laughs> right. <laughs> Literally get the email, 11 59. I'm like, whose end of day was this? Right. right? Well, mine, I was working, uh, you said end of day, so I got it to you. So, um, you know, so the, all these things that we used as colloquialisms and meant something for rumors and extras don't mean anything. Don't, they don't have the same meaning. So one, what are the behaviors you're all going to have? So everyone has, you know, regardless of how old you are, you're going to have the same behaviors. You're going to say please and thank you. You're going to stand up when you uh, greet somebody. You're going to open the door for whoever it is. You're going to uh, whatever, whatever the behaviors. Right. Then also being as specific as possible. Setting expectations with specificity is the most important thing you can do in an intergenerational office because what I just said, right? End of day meant something to me. It doesn't mean anything to somebody younger than me. So mm. uh, for instance, don't, uh, what I recommend is to say, hey, Dominic, I need your draft in Word, not in Google Docs, in, gotcha. Word, <laughs> <laughs> right. in email, in email by uh, tomorrow, January, what's tomorrow? January 18th at uh, 1230 Pacific time. Right. And that seems like a lot of, wow, that's a lot of detail. I right. Want word. I want it Friday, January uh, 18th, and I want it 12.30 p.m. Pacific time. Well, you're in Tennessee. You are three hours ahead of me. Right. And if you got it to me, maybe you thought I meant uh, 12.30 your time. Well, I'm not looking at it at 9.30. I'm going to look at it at 12.30. So the more specificity you can drive, even when you're in the same time zone, the more mm -hmm. specificity you can drive into your instruction and your expectation, the less conflict you're going to have. For sure. Um, and so setting the behaviors that your company is going to allow and, and model, right? Mm -hmm. And then being specific as possible. And then the third piece is setting as much context as possible. You know, do it because I said so only works in jail today. It may right. not work there. Right. Um, and this is not how boomers grew up. Boomers grew up saying, okay, I'll do whatever you need me to do. Yes, sir. Do you need me, how high do you need me to jump? Right. Right. And, um, and my experience with millennials and I understand it from how they grew up and how education worked is that people want to know why they're doing something. That's true. So if you can start a project, not just saying, okay, Dominic, I need you to do that by Thursday at noon or Thursday end of day, you say, Dominic, we have this project. Here's the project. The project, uh, the project is this, and this is why we're doing it. We're doing this project because um, the client's goal is to have this event and we're going to do this. Our project is to make sure the client, you know, set the client up for best success they need to be able to green light that thing by Friday morning. So we're going to get it to them by Thursday at two. Mm -hmm. um, and our, we're going to work together on that. Your job is to do the research. My job is to, um, I'm going to go talk to some potential partners and Gloria is going to go do this and this and this. So I, and then we're all going to meet on uh, Wednesday night and uh, Wednesday night around five before we, you know, knock off for the day. And we're going to see where we are to see what pieces are missing so that by 
but by Thursday morning, we're rocking and rolling, and Thursday at 2 o'clock, we can send this over. So I have just told you everything you need to know, right? I have told right. you here's the project, here's why it's important, here's what the client's going to do for it, with it, um, and when they need something. I've told you what the three roles are in the small team of ours, and I've told you when things are due and when we're going to check in and then uh, figure things out, right? Now you can go work. You don't have right. any questions. What right. questions could you possibly have? Right. right. Um, and this is actually everybody works better when they know all those things. That's but millennials, true. millennials um, will not work without it in a in an efficient manner. Is my experience because they've never had to, uh, and their expectation is that they will understand the purpose of something before they go forward. And why is that? Because their parents have told them. Don't take a crappy job without purpose. And their parents have told them you want work-life balance. That is true. Uh, and if you think about, um, there's 25 years of reporting. There used to be this thing called a newspaper. Maybe you've seen one. <laughs> but every newspaper <laughs> had somebody dedicated to work-life balance, dedicated to the office, right? Right. And for 25 years. And you have that happening at the same time as Oprah Winfrey has a show that is telling women that they deserve more. So it is not a surprise that these women's children are looking for work-life balance and purpose the day one they show up in an office. It's just mm -hmm. like a pain in the butt to deal with for those of us who never had that expectation. Gotcha. And, is that start, a long answer? Sorry. You keep oh, asking no, it, quick answers and I keep not giving them okay. to you. <laughs> it's, it's totally okay because I, I think, you know, it, it gives Startup Nation a very detailed look into, you know, why millennials are important to the workplace and how to, you know, get them invested. Because when you talked about, you know, you know, the purpose of this and the other, like it really spoke to me because I know yeah. like I want to know like why, why should this matter? Why? And I know to most is like, you know, we got to get this done and that's all that matters. But like for me, it's like I need to know why right. I should be invested in this project. So no, yeah. I, I appreciate you explaining and if, that for sure. And if you understand the context, you might, you know, here's what I have learned, right? When I right. And explain the context, better results come. Why do better results sure. come? Because people are thinking about, oh my gosh, this could make it better. Absolutely. What if I, oh my gosh, this could make, oh my gosh, that can make it better, right? And people yes. want, my experience is everybody wants to contribute. Everyone wants to do their best. For and sure. when you can provide that context so people with their own free mind can think, you know, try to solve problems, that's what people want to do. People are inspired by that. Right. Um, but it wasn't how work used to happen, right? right. It's a very flat world where, you know, I might be the lowest person on the totem pole, you are my boss, and then we have Gloria who's in the middle, right? But I'm the most important person to you right this moment in time on this project because if I don't do my job, Dominic, you can't do yours, right? Right. And me understanding that you're counting on me is the most powerful thing that you can have anybody in your team understand. For sure. For sure. Thank right? you for sharing all of that. You know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I appreciate that. You know, let's shift gears just for a little bit because, mm -hmm. you know, you often talk about, you know, we need more women authors, you know, talking yes. about how to lead and run companies. And I want to dive yeah. into that a little bit. Do you think if, if we were to accomplish this, you know, in the American workspace, uh, do you think we'll, you know, it will lead to fostering gender equality and even stamping out gender bias a little bit? I do. Okay. The same thing I think about um, uh, black authors and Asian authors and people who, you know, not white men authors. And I actually I'm never sure. thought I would be that person. Okay. I... You know, I mean, I was obviously a woman in business, but right. you know, I didn't under, I really never thought I was that person. <laughs> and then the last presidential election happened and I became that person who had a much better understanding of how privileged I was as a white person. And then also a much stronger understanding of how uh, much opportunity I hadn't have, even though I own my own company and I've had a lot of success as a white entrepreneur. Right. As a woman, not a white, as a woman entrepreneur. For sure. For sure. So, and then when I went, uh, when I wrote my book, I was, you know, my name, Lee Carraher, I spell it L E E. And mm -hmm. so it's, a, it's the masculine version of the right. name Lee. I'm actually right. named after Robert E. Lee, even though I'm not from the South. Okay. My parents thought we were going to move to Chattanooga. They were from, they were Yankees and they thought we were moving to Chattanooga. We better have a Southern name because we're Yankees. Of course, they do that and then we move to Boston. But my first <laughs> name is Georgina, which I don't use um, okay. because my mom was Georgina, my grandmother was Georgina, so they just call me Lee. So that's a long story. So, um, but people don't know that I'm 
uh, what a lot of people don't know, if you don't go look me up and you've never heard me, you don't may not know that I'm a woman just from the way my name is spelled. And um, I have seen it in my own life where people think I'm a man, I get a lot more opportunity than when people know that I'm a woman. So when I wrote my first book, I was invited to a lot of things where I was the only woman in the room because they thought I was a man. And I didn't, had never really experienced that um, so blatantly <laughs> before. Right. Um, and then when I thought about it more after literally, you're going to know so much more about me than you ever wanted to, Dominic. Oh, no, no, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. <laughs> I am all for it. I was before. watching the second debate between our current president and his former uh, opponent. Okay. And he called Hillary Clinton a nasty woman. Right. And that day, I was three days away from having to turn in the transcript for my second book. And I was okay. actually considering not turning it in. I'm like, you know what? I've already done a book. I'm really busy. I got things going on, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And I, I saw that moment and uh, it hit me. It just hit me in the gut. And I, which I never thought I was that person. Mm. And I stood up and I went over to my desk. We had this, t our t in our TV room is where my desk is on the other corner. And my husband's like, what are you doing? I'm, I'm going to finish my book right now. Because wow. I realized in that moment, it was like, I'm not wow. going to run for office. Right. But I have, I have a book deal. I am right. a woman CEO who's writing a book about how to run a business in the future. And there are very few of us. And if I can do anything, right. I can do. I can contribute a woman's voice to how to run a company. Right. And that was why I finished the second book. That, wow. Uh, that's what inspired me to finish it. Because, um, you know, I think women and men are different. I think uh, different experiences shape us. Right. And that those different experiences, we are in the most, our country is only going to become more diverse. It is not going to become less diverse. Right. And the more diverse, we know this, right? Here's what we know that as a fact. We right. also know from so much research is that when you have a diverse set of inputs, you make better decisions 89% of the time. Gotcha. So if you're one, don't make a decision by yourself. It's the big one. You always want to make a decision with a group. And if that group looks like you, uh, you're going to make a worse decision than if the group doesn't look like you. We know this. This is fact. It's been, I mean, so much research on this topic. So there's so, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, you are, you know, I think the best entrepreneurs are life. They're striving for knowledge. They're looking for thirsting for input. They're like, Oh my gosh, what about this? What about that? Right. And they're looking for examples of what to do when they hit the so same sort of situation, not to necessarily follow exactly what the, per that input tells you, but to, you know, that experience, that gestalt experience of, Oh, Lee was faced with that and she did this. I'm faced with this, so I'm going to do that because I, looking what she did, here's how that translates in my life. And on, as entrepreneurs, that's a responsibility is to do the best we can with the situations that, are, that come our way, right? Right. And I think that the best entrepreneurs, the people listening to your podcast, they're thirsting for information. Absolutely. If Absolutely. you went and looked at the book, if you Googled right now, the 10, 20 books every entrepreneur should read, um, you will probably find you'll find lots of lists and um, on a list of 20, maybe two of them are women. And it's probably Doris Kearns, Ed, uh, Doris Evans Kearns, who's mm -hmm. um, the historian. And right. the, the book is um, Team of uh, Rivals. Team of Rivals. Okay. Right. And it's about mm -hmm. leadership around among diverse and uh, people who don't agree. Right? right. He was an amazing person who brought people who hated him into his cabinet and became best friends. Right. Um, and I reread that last year because it's just as a reminder uh, that we can all get along. Right. We can, if you have the right mindset, you can get along with anybody who disagrees with you. I believe that. I believe it, you know, if, if you have the right mindset. So Team of Rivals is on the list. And then maybe there's another book on the list. But everything else is by a man. And not that these men books written by men are bad. They're not. They're great. Right. But women think differently. And right. if you have a different um, point of view, you think differently, right? You have a different upbringing, you think differently. And we want, we need to hear from different voices. So that is, um, the empirical data is that that is true, right? When we listen to opposing views and when we listen to people who had different points of view than ours that input that input has an impact and even if you don't think it has an impact it has an impact right uh, because you know we you know as entrepreneurs you want to live in a high input low democracy world where you're getting lots of lots of input and you make a decision it's not a vote 
you're not voting a, you might vote on a color for a wall, but you're not gonna, or lunch, where should we have lunch? Vote. You're not gonna vote on the direction for the company. You're gonna get a lot, you wanna get lots of input and then you as the leader, as the entrepreneur needs to make the decision. And if you're in a high input, low democracy situation uh, where you're getting lots of different kinds of input, look for people right. who look like you. Look for people who don't live where you live. Mm. Look for people who, um, have different experiences than you do right? so that you can, you know, you're putting your ideas up against this litmus test because we're not, none of us are right all the time. Right. We're all improved by other people's input. And that's why I think um, more people who aren't, and this sounds so terrible. I'm like, I'm disparaging white men. I'm not, I'm just saying, gotcha. you know what? Everyone can pr publish their own book today. And uh, send me your book. I will review it on my website and I'll talk about it in any podcast you want me to because right. you know, seriously, I read, I read at least 52 books a year. I'm looking for lots of inputs and I, some of them are crap, but it doesn't mean that didn't have an impact on me. For sure. And, and I appreciate you sharing that. And, you know, because the thing is, you're absolutely right. I, I'm all about not just diversity of, you know, uh, you know, religion, race, this, and the other, but I'm also a, a proponent and an advocate for pro diversity of thought. And you're mm -hmm. absolutely right that women do think differently. And I think that voice needs to be heard. Uh, not just kind of thinking about, you know, you was talking about the election and stuff like that. Uh, I remember during the campaign season when uh, President Obama was stomping mm -hmm. for uh, Hillary Clinton. And mm -hmm. he, he said that, you know, she is by far the most qualified person to ever run for that office. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about it. I was like, he's right. Yeah, he's so right. And then it made me think about like all, you know, the women that you know I've encountered in my professional life and this that, and the other, how many times they've gotten passed over for mm -hmm. promotion or a, a job or something like that. And so it actually made me look inward to myself. Like, do I, you know, you know, help fuel the flames of that bias? And so I really started since that moment to kind of look into myself to make sure I'm trying to, you know, be an advocate of, you know, women's voices, you know, my, me and my wife, we run a company and, and she's the, you know, the, the CEO of that company. So I really try to make it a, a point to support her and champion her and be mm -hmm. her cheerleader and stuff like that. So that way, you know, she knows that I'm, 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 I'm here and I'm here to support you. So I, I appreciate you sharing that Lee. I really do. I really appreciate you sharing that story too, because I think, you know, in Silicon Valley, I can tell you one of the big, you know, the me too, movement um, has a lot of starts, but here in Silicon Valley really started um, significantly with Ellen Powell, who um, yeah. took Kleiner Perkins to right. court over um, uh, gender uh, bias and sexual harassment. And we all knew she was going to lose. Mm. We all knew she was right. Right. <laughs> all the women here. We all right. knew she was right, but we all knew she was going to lose because she was a very unsympathetic um, witness. And Kleiner Perkins just put millions of dollars against her in the public relations campaign. Right. Um, and since then, you know, it's clear that she was right. Um, mm -hmm. And I've had so many men in Silicon Valley and who I sit on boards with or who are clients who have reached out to me to say, you know, I think this is me too. I mean, I, me, I mean, I mm -hmm. think I've been, I think I've been this person. Right. Um, not by intention, but I just, you know, I went out, you know, my buddies and I went out and we decided, made decisions in the bathroom and uh, yeah, women weren't there and they right. couldn't participate. And um, there's one man, uh, actually he's a black man in business. So that's not mm -hmm. very, you know, it's a very low percentage here in San Francisco, black men in, in leadership positions. Right? right. And he had this conversation with me. He goes, you know, I, I want to talk to you over here. We were at a, a party and I said, well, I want to talk to you over here. So I'm like, walk over there. And we're in the middle of the room. So everyone can see us. I'm like, well, what's the deal? He mm -hmm. goes, I want everyone to see us. I don't want anyone to think that, you know, we're going to a corner or anything. I'm like, why? What's the problem? Well, you know, I figured out that maybe I'm a problem in this me too thing. And uh, I don't want it to eat me a, 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 a question that I'm treating you badly or I'm sexually harassing you. I'm like, I'll just use the name Joe. I'm like, Joe, oh my God, no, no one's going to think that. He goes, well, apparently people, you know, people I've worked with think that I'm biased. I'm like, oh yeah, for, for sure you're biased, dude. And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, this is what you said at the last meeting. This is what you said in the meeting before that. This is what you said in the meeting. He goes, I did? I'm like, absolutely. Wow. And you know, he goes, he goes, well, then I can't meet with women anymore. I'm like, no, now you need to meet with more women. Absolutely. Now you need to, you know, choose a, you know, choose a restaurant with a, a lighted center, you know, go to the middle, don't read in the dark room, but you need to meet with more women now. 
Be right. that guy. Be the man who goes and meets with more women and works through this. Don't go into a closet, please. Don't right. retreat. Uh, don't just go to the men's room and talk about it because now's the time for you to start meeting with more women. And he, he, you know, I was very impassioned about it and we'd known mm -hmm. each other for a long time and he had tears in his eyes. He was so just so conflicted with, he, he, I thought I was a good person. I said, you are a good person. Right. You know, it doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It means now you're woken up to the fact that you have not always been even handed right. and not always been inclusive. He goes, Lee, I'm a black man. Of course I've been inclusive. Right. Uh, have you made a decision in the bathroom? Yes, I have. All right. Therefore, you know, and he's right. like, right. I don't like that. I don't like this conversation. I said, well, I really appreciate your having it with me. And no matter what, air quote, Joe, you're right. going to, <laughs> you're going to make different decisions now. Absolutely. So no matter what, you're in a better position. Absolutely. But it's been very heart wrenching for very thousands of men here. In uh, I, I, I know it. I know it has for me because like I say, it really made me, it forced me to kind of like, you know, take a step back. Like, you know, have I done this? You know, have I said something inappropriate? Have I been you know, inadvertently dismissive and things like that, for sure. Really quickly, Lee, you know, I know you you, you wrote another book, The Boomerang Principle, right? Mm -hmm. You know, which is the number one uh, book in Amazon uh, office management space. And I really love that you wrote this book because, you know, I'm one of those older millennial, millennials that was supposed to be loyal to a company, right? And yes. So when, <laughs> and, and so when me and my wife, you know, left to start my company, I used to say, hey, you know, here's my two weeks notice, this, that, and the other. Uh, you know, I, I think I'm about to, you know, venture out on my own. And my you know, direct boss was like, you know, you kids know nothing about loyalty. And I, mm. and I always think it's fascinating that like when it comes to me as the employee going to another job, it's about loyalty. But if you were to like fire me the next day, <laughs> that's business, exactly. right? Right. And, and so, right. And, and so, you know, that's why I love you, why you wrote this book. So let's start up nation know what they can expect when they purchase this book. Sure. So the boomerang is called the boomerang principle and right. it's about lifetime employee loyalty, even when people don't work for you. And um, it's about creating businesses that people return to gotcha. because we know that, so you're the older millennial set right. and um, you, one, the, the hubris to think that any company could hold a person for their career when they're going to be working for 60 years, not 40 or even 20 years is right. ridiculous. Okay. Number one. Right. <laughs> and number two, that what you described is exactly right. Right. We call it loyalty because people we, we're disappointed with people's loyalty when they leave on their own terms, not on our terms as employees. Right. And that's crap. Right. So mm -hmm. basically um, sustainable businesses are going to be the ones that, uh, that have great people come to them where great people achieve uh, for the company and for their own careers, where great people leave you, uh, go do something else, but are still loyal to you out there in the world, and they return to you. They return to you as a partner. They return to you as a referrer. They return to you as another uh, an employee again, a full right. boomerang coming back to be employed again. And so the principle is those companies that encourage and allow people to return have a strategic advantage over those who don't because the things that you do to create a company that people return to are the things that create a sustainable business. Right. And, and I appreciate you sharing that with me because when I first thought about the boomerang principle, I honestly just thought about only about like people coming back to, you know, the original place, you know, to work mm -hmm. there. But when you talk right. about, you know, consumers, referrals, partners, clients in your book and that quote, contractors and all these other things. Yeah. Like, I just opened up my whole mind to that. So I really appreciate that you shared that. So I mean, every you know, time you, can I, I'm gonna, no, sure. Go for, it, go for it. Every time you have someone leave you, cause they're all going to leave, right? You hire right. someone and you know, they're going to quit. Right. You know, they're going to leave you when you hire them. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not a surprise, right? And I actually say this to all my people in the first week, they all meet with me, new, new hires. I'm like, I know right. you're going to quit sometime. And they all look at me like, I just got here late. You're talking about me quitting. And I'm like, I know, but here's the deal, right? So I'm just going to put it on the table. I'm going to put it on the table that this company probably can't hold you for your whole life. I hope it holds you for a very long time. I hope that you achieve everything you want to achieve at this company and you never want to leave. But I'm realistic. I'm pragmatic. I left, I've left many companies. I've started this my own, right? right. Um, but what's important to me 
as a business owner is that being at Double Forte is important to you when you leave here, that you never take it off your resume. Because if you never take it off your resume for a 50, 60 year career, that means it was important to you. Mm. Um, and how am I gonna know you do that? You're gonna refer business to me. We're always gonna be connected. Um, you're going to refer people. You're gonna say, hey, Dominic. Oh my gosh, Dominic, I know you're looking for a new job. You need to go talk to Lee. She may have, I don't know if she has a position for you, but you'd be perfect there, right? It didn't cost you anything to do. It just was part of your heart, part of your being, right? Absolutely. And the most, um, and that's what you need for a sustainable business, right? You, every time someone leaves you today, they can hurt you or help you. Do right. everything they can so they can help you. It's Absolutely. really simple. Right. It's a really Absolutely. simple concept. It's hard to do. Simple concept. And frankly, I think that the most loyal thing a person can do is leave, is leave you when they're not, <clears throat> excuse me, mm -hmm. is leave you when they're not inspired by the opportunity, the job, the industry, whatever. Because Absolutely. if you just have someone sitting there doing, you know, 70 uh, percent, you know, we don't have time for 70 percenters in our businesses, particularly as small business owners. Right. Hello? Right. Right. Anyway, so that's the premise. Got you. Thank you for sharing that. And Startup Nation, you can get both of those books, Millennials and Management and The Boomerang Principle uh, from Amazon. And I have a link in the show notes for easy access for you to purchase those books. So Lee, you know, you've been you know, doing amazing work at Double Forte for 16 years now. And you've worked with some amazing companies. You mentioned Cliff Bar earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. so you did some work for the NFL Network. But yep. for me, I'm a video gamer. So when I oh, saw that you did some there we work, go. When I saw that you did some work for E3, I was, I was like, oh my God, I have to ask this question. I have to ask this question. We've been working for E3 for 10 years. It's our wow. 11th year with them. Yeah. Wow. So really quickly, you know, I know you, you know, you did some work for them in the summer of 2017 yep. uh, to garner some, generating some buzz and some media attention for the event. What was the game plan and what was the result of that game plan? So the game plan for E3, you know, video games is one of, uh, you know, a lot of people discount it as like, oh, this video games. Billions and billions of dollars Absolutely. are spent on video games just in this country alone. And um, as an industry, it contributes uh, more net profit than many industries because of the mm -hmm. way it works. Right. And E3 is the um, largest video game conference in the world. Um, but there are obviously uh, other places in the world that video gamers and video game companies go. So our job for E3 is to make sure that the video game industry understands and then the consumers understand that the best place to be to find out what's going on, uh, what's coming up, what's news, all that kind of stuff around the video game business is in Los Angeles at E3. And our game plan is, um, well, it sounds simple, but then it becomes really complicated to implement, <laughs> but uh, it, that's the goal, right? How do we become the best company? So we work with all the companies who come to see what they're going to be announcing to help them maximize the, their announcements for multi, you know, just billions of impressions um, and lots of people. We credential the media that comes to the show. So uh, about 8,000 people from around the world apply to be media people at the show they, so they can come for free and they talk about it on their blogs, on their newspapers, on their uh, television shows, on their radio shows, their podcasts, and we credential those people. So our goal is to get the highest quality people um, with the best reach and, and a diverse audience as possible. Um, and I think we probably said yes to 4,500 people last year mm -hmm. and said no to probably 2,000. Um, because, you know, it's an expensive show to put on. So right. people are welcome to pay for their pass, but people who get free passes have to th hit a certain, certain threshold. And then it's... Um, helping to time everything so that we work with uh, different companies to time announcements, time events, so that we have a constant flow of information from the day before the show until the day after the show. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing that. Like I said, as a video gamer and many of those in Startup Nation, I had to ask that question. So thank you for <laughs> indulging me. What's your favorite game? What are you playing right now? Oh, you know what? Right now, my wife bought me for the holiday. She bought me the NES Classic. Awesome. A little, a little mini. But, yeah. and, and, and so uh, I've been playing that a lot. But she did also buy me uh, the Red Dead Redemption 2 oh. and, and Assassin's Creed. And Assassin's so, Creed. I worked yeah. on that game. It's a great game. Oh, really? Oh, my I goodness. Oh, my, I love it. It's one of my favorite games. I love Assassin's Creed. Love yeah, Assassin's it's a sure. great game. For sure. Uh, really quickly, uh, tell us a little bit about the Millennial Minded Pro uh, Podcast and what listeners can get from that show. 
Sure. So Millennial Mind is a podcast we produce here at Double Forte. It mm-hmm. is, um, uh, it's a career advice uh, podcast for millennials, for younger people. And basically it's uh, one question per podcast. It's about 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. And someone on my team interviews me with the question we get from either our staff, our partners, or people who write into the show. So um, for instance, um, uh, Duncan will ask me a question around like, you know, so, you know, someone wrote in, they want to know what not to do if they would go to get, if they go ask to get a, um, a raise, what should they not do? What should they should do? And so then I just answer the questions off the cuff on here's what I would do. And, and, bo- and then David, who David and, and Duncan are the co-hosts, they make fun of me for the other five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Thank you for sharing it. And Startup Nation, you can check out that podcast uh, on any of your major platforms that you get podcasts from. And we also have a link in the show notes for easy access. So Lee, I saw that your sister has a piece that's going to be featured in the Sundance Film Festival. How excited <gasps> Oh, you? excited about that. Oh okay. my gosh. So, oh my gosh. Could not be more proud of my sister. So my sister is Abby McEnany. She's in Chicago. Right. She is a stand-up and um, improv artist in Chicago, really well-known in the Chicago uh, scene. Mm-hmm. And she and her co-writer have uh, produced a pilot called Work in Progress, which is uh, semi-automatic graphical about her. Okay. And accepted into the Indie Arcade at Sundance. Oh, my mm-hmm. gosh. So excited for her. Awesome. Awesome. Do you, do you help her with her content at all? No, she no. won't let me. <laughs> but I am in the pilot. Apparently, okay. so I have t- there. Sh- we I have three, two sisters. Okay. And she has conflated my sister Lizzie and I into the sister in the show. Mm-hmm. So when I watch the pilot, I'm like, "Is that me? Is that me? <laughs> I was not there. That was not me. <laughs> that was you, Lee. I'm like, I'm sure it wasn't me. So. Got you. Anyway. So I don't gotcha. have other content. I do. Um, I do talk to the people who do, who work with her um, mm-hmm. to help them sort of strategize about it. But I think it would be a bad thing for me to do her content. You know? <laughs> I exactly. would not. You know, if she would be like, I'd be like pushing her for stuff, and she'd be like, I don't have time. I'm like, if you don't have time, I don't have. To, you know, it wouldn't be good. Not good thing. Got you. Thank you for. I'm just a that. cheerleader from the sideline. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. Lee, I believe all entrepreneurs have a superpower. What's yours and why? I think my superpower is one, I can see an answer. Okay. I can see an answer to a problem. It just comes to me and I don't know how it comes to me, but then by the time I've talked it through with people, it's a rational decision. So I am blessed by being very quick. Uh, I'm never the smartest person in the room, but I'm often the quickest person in the room. And that has helped me uh, with a lot of things. I think my other superpower, I have two, Okay. is I just believe everybody has a gift. And my Mm. goal, and I think my superpower is identifying people's gifts so that they can contribute where their strengths are and uh, not focus on their weaknesses. Awesome. Once again, Lee, I want to say thank you for coming on the show. You've been an amazing guest and gave amazing content to all of us here uh, on the Startup Life Podcast, powered by the Bench Podcast Network. But at this point, I would like to ask you one last thing. And this is where we actually uh, have you talk to Startup Nation. There's some people in Startup Nation to where they haven't started their business and they're a little scared to jump off that cliff Mm -hmm. or they're in their business and they feel stuck and they're getting ready to quit and getting ready to just like leave it all alone. Give us some words of wisdom, some words of advice to tell them Mm -hmm. to keep going. So the people who are ready to quit, you know, success comes right after you think you're going to, you're tossing the towel. Mm. So, you know, keep going, get some help, ask other people um, who are in the same situation you are in or who have been in the situation you, you are in today, ask for some help. You do not have to do this alone. You're, you know, entrepreneurs help each other. So uh, keep going. Um, try one more time before you throw in the towel. And if you haven't started your business, I would say, um, you know, a lot of us uh, start our business because we needed to, like I did. Um, some of us are working and they're doing a side hustle where they want to, you know, jump over the leap. I would say to you, you know, just make sure you have a safety net. Um, if you can keep the job uh, so you can build up a little nest egg, do that while you're doing your side hustle, um, getting it all done, and then jump when you're ready. Awesome stuff. Thank you so much, Lee. And that's going to wrap up this session of The Startup Life. Did you enjoy being on the show, Lee? Oh, my gosh, Dominic. I want to come back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. That, 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 I don't have to ask the second question. I would, I would love for you to come back. Awesome. Okay. Well, I realize this is what I welcome myself back onto your show. So you hey, no, that's back, all. It's all good. You're all. You're welcome, welcome back for sure. You're welcome back for sure. All right, Startup Nation. So here's my final take. Lee Carraher is now one of my favorite entrepreneurs. Let me tell you why for two reasons. The first one is, is that she is the ultimate culture builder, right? When she talks about how she wants people who work at Double Forte for it to be a memorable experience in the sense of like, there's a sense of value and there's a sense of trust. And like, even if they decide to move on elsewhere, she still wants them to have that relationship to where they refer her business, they refer her even new employees or whatever. That is something that is so lost in this you know in business and I really appreciate Lee's approach to doing that and secondly I love how Lee's approach to business is just very straightforward and honest and transparent and I also like how she she keeps it loose she doesn't take herself too serious but at the same time my friend she is to be revered in business oh my goodness and that's why Lee care hair she may not know this but now she's one of my new mentors yep that just happened. If you want to let us know what you think about the show, have an idea for a show topic, or like to advertise on our show, please send us a message on the Startup Life Podcast Facebook page. And while you are there, like and follow our page as well. It's a way for us to engage with you, Startup Nation, and really grow our community. The link is here in the show notes. Subscribe to the show as can be now be heard on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or whatever your favorite platform to get your podcast on. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts and you find our content valuable, please give us a five-star rating as it will help us climb the charts and help more people find our show. Also, don't forget to sign up for the Startup Life All Access Pass to get exclusive content. This is exclusively on the Bench Podcast Network's Patreon page. And hey, if you have an idea, be about that life, the Startup Life. Hey, what you doing? You still here, huh? Well, look, if you're going to hang around, you might as well check out next week's episode. Here's the deal. You know, I'm, I'm not afraid of having a, a company flop. I've had, I've had a bunch. Did nothing. Most okay. people are so afraid of making a mistake because it's baked into our training as kids. You make a mistake, you get 50% wrong. It means you're a failure. Uh, you're kicked out. And then you go into the real world. And I look at my third, actually, it's, it's like 45 companies now. And Wow. And people go, that's a lot. I'm like, yeah, more than half of those failed. So basically, I'm a big fat failure. And yet, I'm a multimillionaire and I've, I, I hire people. I, I, have, I have teams. I'm impacting people. I'm giving people freedom because I'm willing to go out there and stub my toe, trip and bleed and have things not work. That, my friends, is Damian Lupo, serial entrepreneur and creator of a martial art. Yeah, you heard that right. Creator of a martial art. Go ahead and subscribe to The Startup Life now on any of your favorite podcast platforms. So that way, when that episode with Damien is available, you'll have it. So now, get out of here, Startup Nation. You got a company to grow, remember?